The Halloween franchise has continued for as long as we can remember, and just recently, another installment has hit the big screen. However, it looks like the film isn't as well received as the director would have liked, but with all the criticism that the fans have had for Halloween Ends, it looks like none of it is welcome. Let's talk about how the Halloween Ends director has decided to respond to all the backlash, starting with what the director had to say about the backlash. With a disappointing 57% on Rotten Tomatoes, the much-anticipated sequel has failed to connect with audiences is on the same level as the first few films in this legendary slasher genre. David Gordon Green, writer and director of Halloween Ends, has addressed fan criticism by saying he accepts that some viewers won't like the end to the franchise. As Green talked about the film's harsh reviews, he accepted it isn't made for everyone and even clarified that he set out to create something for which viewers might take away different meanings. Now, while the ambiguity of the ending might not appeal to many, it's exactly what the writer had envisioned for the franchise. Project. And after all, you can't really judge the artist for how they want their art to turn out, right? He said, It's funny when someone says, Building your dream house on this real estate using this title and these characters, everybody's going to find a different little thing that's meaningful for them, and they'll make it their own. He explained, saying it was exactly what he had envisioned the ending to be like. He said, There are as many naysayers as there are people who appreciate your refreshing approach. And the continued presence of so much love from all over the world kind of made up for the backlash. Not to forget, he also got hate for some characters. A lot of times, films get negative criticism, and directors or writers don't pay any heed to it. But Green really had to speak out because this isn't the first time he's facing something like this. The film's narrative has been met with mixed reviews, with some viewers disliking the introduction of a new significant character so late in the franchise's history. Fan opinion was split on the writer's choice to add Corey Cunningham to the cast. Some liked the addition, while others felt he stole the show from Mike Michael Myers and Laurie Strode. But to be honest, can anyone really steal the show from the infamous Myers? But don't you worry, the director had a response for that as well. Green said that he wanted to have a different viewpoint on Michael Myers and Laurie Strode and the family when he was explaining why he decided to make Corey a lead. He went on to say that the film was able to go beyond the typical kills seen in the series by including Corey. So while many of us were super into the creative ways Michael Myers would commit murder, David was thinking of all the ways he could bring some fresh perspective into the movie. Kudos for that because he definitely got people talking about something other than murder. Let's talk about why he went with a different approach. Green also added that one thing he wanted to explore is someone who is copying these acts of violence, but is messy and doesn't know how to get it right. So rather than a clean slash to the neck, he's got a corkscrew and he's just jabbing it madly into a man's throat. Think of it as someone who's kind of doing the same thing Myers was famous for, but just a little horribly. The man said that that's something that Halloween movies don't do because it's not within the character of Michael Myers. But I wanted that midnight movie madness. Moving on, he had an alternative ending too. He hinted at an early script that was a far more direct reference to the long-running franchise. He said that he had written an alternate finale for the movie that was never produced. It took place at the Silver Shamrock Factory while it was cranking out its Halloween masks. Then it began spitting out masks of Michael Myers. Jeez. Although Green told us the deets, he did say that he ultimately dismissed it as a fan service for those familiar with the Silver Shamrock series. Looks like he was really looking for something unique, and he got that. Moreover, the director offered some insight into one of the relationships. Green wanted to leave his mark on the series, so he wrote a darker romance story about Corey and Allison to show that evil can come from anybody other than Michael Myers. Corey, the social outcast, was the ideal recipient of Myers' terrible legacy. It creates a far different route to evil than Myers by portraying him as an attempting to gain love and acceptance in Haddonfield, but it only ended in him repeatedly getting humiliated and driven to the edge as the locals peg him as a killer. Green even consulted series originator John Carpenter before deciding to include Corey, drawing parallels between his radical approach and Carpenter's own equally radical Halloween 3. Let's take a look at five underappreciated horror movies with ambiguous endings. First off, At It Follows. With its concept of a sexually transmitted Ghost. It follows, introduce something fresh to the horror genre. Once a person has been infected, an invisible thing starts following them around. The entity is getting closer and closer, and because it can take the appearance of anybody, it is becoming more difficult to see. When it inevitably catches up, a horrible end is not far behind. When the creature kills its target, it returns its attention to the previous host. So, the only way to halt the curse is to pass it on to someone else and pray it never gets them. Jay, our protagonist, must keep moving 
moving while she searches for a permanent solution to the problem posed by the entity. The film ends with Jay and her new lover holding hands and strolling down the street at peace at last. The two people are unaware of the individual stumbling behind them. Is this someone going about their day, or is the entity still following? Next, The Crazies. The Crazies are a remake of an early film by George A. Romero about a community invaded by a virus that transforms people into mindless murderers. While the infected pose a threat, the military's willingness to resort to whatever means necessary to stop the epidemic poses an even greater danger. The film ends with two survivors leaving the village just in time to avoid the approaching destruction. As they reach a new town, however, it becomes clear that they are being monitored by a satellite. Plus, a new confinement procedure starts, indicating that they have not yet reached the end of the issue. Following up, The Thing. While the unknown is often explored in the context of horror films, few go beyond the film's duration like John Carpenter's The Thing. The Thing, one of the most powerful horror films of the 1980s, plays on the public's dread of invisible foes, which is a metaphor for illness and sickness. Not to mention, it has some of the most impressive special effects and makeup ever used. The Thing's greatness lies in the fact that it provides no satisfying endings. At the film's end, it's possible the monster is still alive. McReady, portrayed by Kurt Russell, may be an unreliable narrator since he can only establish his humanity to a certain extent. Now, that's what you can call ambiguity in an ending. It's assumed that the creature made it, either in the body of one of the survivors or dormant under the snow, waiting to be thawed out by another rescue team. This would be like the Norwegians did initially, or like the actors in this film did by providing a new set of hosts when the first set failed to contain the threat. The Thing is a great example of the unknown terror since the ambiguity persists beyond the film's end, when a weaker film would have made a clear finale. Not to mention The Host. If you thought The Parasite was Bong Joon the Ho's best work, you definitely need to check out this movie. The story focuses on a father's search for his kidnapped daughter. The creature is eventually burned alive and then re-enters the river from where it came. Despite the loss of his daughter, the father takes in another child who is victimized by the monster. At the end of the film, he is shown sitting on the bank of the river armed with a rifle, waiting for the monster to return. Finally, The Shining. The Shining, directed by Stanley Kubrick, is commonly considered one of the best examples of a horror film genre. Jack Nicholson plays a family guy who checks into a remote hotel with his loved ones, only to have the evil spirit there lead him down a dangerous road. The father tries to murder his kid, but instead falls prey to the circumstances. The film ends with a view of a snapshot of a celebration that took place in 1921 and in which the father is featured. This might indicate that his soul is now an integral part of the hotel, or that he has some otherworldly connection to it. But all in all, the ending's up for interpretation. That's a wrap for this video. What did you think of the ending? Let us know in the comments below. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. See you in the next one.